Our lives are marked with calling, calling from a great God who chooses to use us to further his kingdom. Throughout history, we see people who have said yes to this calling, and in doing so, have been used by God in incredible, eternal ways. In the Bible, we see many examples of people running toward the calling on their lives. However, we also read of people who ran away from God. Which one are you? Do your fears, your struggles, your disappointments in people tempt you to turn and flee from the very mission that God has for you? Perhaps you've even forgotten what you yourself have been saved from. Our God is big, and his love for us is infinite. May we not run from him and his plans, but instead embrace the calling on our lives and take this infinite love to a lost and dying world. All right, good morning, everybody. How you doing out there? Doing good? All right, welcome, welcome. Yeah, you can clap, you can clap anytime. Yeah, this is a great place of celebration. Hey, I just I want to celebrate um, a couple of different uh, folks, and that is all of our first time, our new guests with us today, and all those watching online right now as well. Can we welcome our online church family? We're so glad you're tuning in on YouTube or Facebook or wherever you're at. We're glad. Maybe you're traveling. Someone said, I'm going to be, someone told me last week, I'm going to be gone for a few weeks, and I, I want to be able, I don't want to miss a service, and so I want to be able to tune in, and so uh, if that's you, we're, we're glad that you're tuning in with us this morning. I want, I'm eager to get into the Word of God with you this morning, but because of Pastor Eli's amazing setup to this series of Jonah, right? Um, yeah, he thought, he's, Pastor Eli's a, a father of five, do you know that? <clears throat> so he's, he's got dad jokes coursing through his veins, all right? He's, so anyway, that was good, good setup. Um, and he found that on the fly, too, between services, because he didn't do that the first service. But anyway, um, I do have a few important announcements to tell you about. And that is, number one, at the end of July, we are going to, um, in, we're having a, an event here called District Assembly. Think of it more like a family reunion, okay? There's going to be like 70 some churches here from all across the state of Kansas, and we do this once a year as an opportunity to give God thanks for all that has happened in the past. It's, a, it's an opportunity to look forward and just and, and give ourselves to Him and His mission in the year ahead. And, and we just, we're going to hear some great worship services, um, especially that, that Thursday night and if Friday night, there's going to be some great worship services, our own worship. And then, here's what I'm going to tell you. They're, they're, we're hosting it here. That's why I'm telling you all this, because I want you to come and experience this um, as, as just a participant, but we also need quite a few folks to step up and serve. And so on the table, out in the foyer, the black tablecloth, you'll, you'll see lots of clipboards there. And several different teams that you could serve on. We need all we need greeters, hospitality. We're going to be serving some um, refreshments. We need people in you know nursery, childcare, all these things. Set up and tear down. There's a massive amount of set, setting up and tearing down to do to get ready for different nights, different things that are going on. And we just want to be really good hosts. So we want to be equipped and prepared for that. So we need we need lots of people to come. We we need you to. Not serve the whole weekend. We're not asking that. We're just asking, would you pick a time slot? Would you pick an evening or a day, if you're free during the day, to come and, and serve and just be a part of it? And I, I believe you'll be very blessed as you're participating in the worship or serving, whatever you're doing, all right? Uh, so Pastor Sarah has got, um, if I could point you to any team, check out the child care team for sure. We need everybody in many roles, but child care is the one we're going to be really heavy loaded down with because we got lots of kids coming uh, from all these parents and all these people from different churches coming, bringing their kids as well. All right, it's going to be a great event, though, so mark that on your calendars um, at the end of July there, okay? And then also, again, happy Father's Day. We've got some fun things, hopefully, for you out in the foyer. Maybe you saw Dad's junk drawer table. If you haven't already grabbed your item, you get to pick, okay? You get to pick one thing from that table and, and enjoy it, use it, and then there's a photo booth and all that good stuff. And then let me remind you also of uh, July 3rd, July 3rd, which is... Uh, couple weeks from now, we will not be meeting here, but at 10 o'clock in the morning, we'll be at Heritage Park, all right? And I'll be, uh, there's actually a couple of us sharing God's Word. I'm going to be one of them. I'm going to be preaching that morning as well. Uh, from the big stage in Heritage Park, it's outdoors, so bring your lawn chairs, blankets, uh, bring some drinks, just be ready. 10 o'clock, we'll hopefully be done before it gets too hot. Uh, but we'd love to see you come out to the park, and that's always an exciting service, just all the churches of this area coming together, many of them anyway. And uh, really looking forward to that. So I wanted you to make you aware of that. Spread the word. July 3rd, no services here. We'll be at Heritage Park at 10 o'clock. All right. 
With that, if you're ready this morning, if you are ready to jump into the living and active Word of God that is able to transform you and build you up in the faith, say, let's go. All right, amen, amen. I thought that was a lot better way to begin than please turn to Jonah chapter 1. I just like. We don't do boring here at JC Nath. We, we like to have fun, and the Word of God should be exciting to you. And I just got to tell you this morning, I really, really believe this stuff that I declare to you every week, okay? I really believe it. By God's grace, I'm, I'm wanting to line my life up with the Word of God more and more because, I'm, again, I'm telling you, the Word of God is living and active, and it's able to transform your life this morning, okay? It is based on how you respond to it. And so I just want you to ready yourself. I want you to have, let the Word of God have the full impact it, it can have, that God wants it to have on your life, all right? I'm so, so grateful for this opportunity to connect with God through His Word, and you're all here together, and it's an awesome morning, all right? So here we go, beginning in Jonah chapter 1. Now the, <laughs> now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for how many days and nights? Three days and three nights. Does that ring a bell to anybody? Do you know anybody else who spent three days and three nights somewhere? That's right. His name is Jesus. That's right. And here's the incredible thing about God's Word, okay? Anytime you read God's Word, wherever you are reading, Old Testament, New Testament, how many of you know it all points to Jesus, amen? It all points to and reaffirms the supremacy of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, Jesus our Lord, He, was, he came to this earth from heaven took on flesh to show us the love of the Father and the message of the Father. He declared that faithfully and perfectly. He, he was tempted in every way but we, as we are, but He was without sin. So therefore, He was qualified to be our sinless sacrifice on the cross. And He came and lived among us. He died a horrible criminal's death, even though He had done nothing wrong. On the cross, He was buried. He was put in that tomb. They sealed the rock in front of it. But here's the greatest news that has ever been declared. Just like He promised Three days later, he rose from the dead. Amen? Woo! I feel an Easter message coming on, y'all. Come on. That's right. Um, hey, we're a long ways from Easter, but how many of you are grateful for new life in Christ this morning, right? New life and new power in the Lord Jesus Christ. So even this little part of Jonah mentioning being in the belly of the fish, Jesus was in the belly of the earth, you might say, for three days and three nights, but he conquered the grave. Praise his name. And just a little recap of last week, just in case you weren't here or you forgot everything we talked about, all right? It's why you got to take notes, all right? You got to take some notes today so you won't forget. But we're, we are journeying, we're journeying through this very small, very short, but very powerful part of God's Word called Jonah. And Jonah was a real person, okay? Jonah really did live. And he had a very, very special assignment from God. He had a calling upon his life, just like you do if you're a follower of Christ. Jonah's calling was to be a prophet of God. Now, we don't have prophets today. It's not like you got to go, we don't got to have a prophet to get a word from God. But you understand something. This is before the Bible was written. This is before Jesus came. This is before the Holy Spirit was poured out. And this is the way God was pleased to speak His word and, and declare His will to the people. And he used prophets. He spoke to His people in many different ways. On many occasions, the Bible says, through the prophets. But in these days, Hebrews declares, he has been pleased to speak to us through his son. And Jonah was one of those prophets. Jonah's job was to hear from God. He was to receive the message God had for him. Then he was to take that message and faithfully declare it to the people of God. And yet we learned last week that Jonah was um, unique among the prophets because most of them did their job very faithfully. But Jonah was a reluctant prophet. Meaning when he heard what God wanted him to do, he said, um, no thanks, not going to do it, <laughs> not interested, God. And Jonah did a very, very dangerous and foolish thing. Here's what he did. He chose his will over God's will. That's what he did. And how many of you know from personal experience or maybe from observing others that never, ever leads to a good place? Okay, I'm just here to tell you, as sure as I live and breathe, nothing good will ever come from you choosing your will and your way over God's. And so let me, let me just highlight a couple major points from last week just as a way to recap and, and, and get us all back on the same page if you weren't here last week. And, and this is something I hope you're wrestling with, this, this question that we asked last week. I hope it's something you're wrestling with a little bit even this week and letting God speak to you from. Because last week we all 
put ourselves under the microscope of this question, all right? And here's the question, okay? What are you running away from that you should be running to? Is there anything in your life, any area of your life where you're running away? God has spoken to you clearly. You understood it. You know what he's wanting you to do, how he's wanting, but you've run away from it instead of running to it, all right? And, and, and that's what Jonah did, right? And I, I heard so many great testimonies from, from quite a few last week who, who, who said, you know, God spoke to me. When you asked that question, God spoke to me about something very, very specific. And, and again, I was so grateful to hear that these people weren't running from that. They were taking action on it. They were saying yes to God as he made that clear to them. But it's a question we all need to be asking ourselves. And I just, I want more than anything in this season of my life, I want to make a fresh commitment to God, and I hope you do too. That whatever God asks of me, wherever God wants to lead me, I want to be the kind of servant of Jesus. I want to be the kind of father. I want to be the kind of husband. I want to be the model for my family. I want to be the kind of pastor that where I don't live in fear, but instead by his grace and power, I want to to be the kind of person that runs to the uncomfortable places even that God's calling me to. Because here's what I've discovered time and time again. I've discovered That even when I can't see it, even when I don't understand it, on the other side of my fear, on the other side of my full surrender, it's then that we see God show up and we see God do mighty things that we never would have experienced. We would have never seen Him do if we had chose to run from it or take the easy way from it. And so Jonah, though, he gets a word from God. And it's a challenging word. There's no doubt about it. And Jonah basically says, nope. I don't like it. He's like a little toddler. Nope, I don't like it, and I'm not going to do it. No one can make me, he thought. He, he, listen, he actually thought that he knew better than God. Can you believe that? And again, last week we were reminded that there are times when God will intersect our lives. He'll intervene in our, 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 the normal flow of our life, and sometimes he will ask us to do things that we may not like. You know, I thought about this too. Most Christians are fine with following God's path for their life as long as it as long as it eventually spills out into the one they've already chosen for themselves. They're like, oh, this, this is great, God. Yeah, I would gladly do what you want until it counteracts that, until it goes against the grain of what they would prefer to do. Many times, then we resist and we run just like Jonah. And, and when God interrupts our plans, when He intersects and intervenes and speaks a, a challenging word into our lives about something He wants us to do, Just like Jonah, we have a decision to make at that moment, at those crossroads. Am I going to run? Am I going to resist? Am I going to take the easy way out? Or, or, and this is the this is the the right choice, am I going to yield myself entirely to God and trust him enough to do it his way? And and as we see so clearly in the story of Jonah, whatever you decide, whatever you decide at that point, whether you're like a Jonah or whether you choose to yield yourself entirely and obey. It has tremendous impact upon your life. And I will say this, not only your life, but on the lives of many people around you, either for positive or for negative. And so Jonah, he gets this life-changing word from God. He receives this invitation from God Almighty to partner with him in his mission, but he doesn't respond in obedience. Instead, he doesn't like it. And so he heads 2,500 miles in the opposite direction that God has called him to go. And somehow he reasoned in his mind You know, if I can just get far enough away from God, maybe I won't hear him. If I can get far enough away from God, maybe I won't have to listen to all this crazy talk about taking this message of hope and taking this message of forgiveness to these wicked people that I don't even like, that I would rather see destroyed, to be truthful, these people called the Ninevites. And so Jonah, what he does, he gets on this boat. Remember last week he found the ship in the bound for the port of Tarshish. 2,500 miles away from where he was. And, and God, what God does is he sends this gigantic storm that threatens to break the ship apart. And all the sailors are fearing for their lives. They're throwing the cargo over the ship to lighten the ship and hope to salvage some things. And it's quite a scene to imagine, really. And interestingly enough, all this running from God has made Jonah pretty tired. And so Jonah, we read in chapter 1, goes down below the deck, and he just falls fast asleep. And the sailors, they cannot believe that he's sleeping. In fact, the captain of the ship goes down. He's like, how are you able to sleep at a time like this? And they urge him. They, they wake him up, and they say, call upon your God. You know, they had all been calling on their gods. They all kind of believed in different gods. And, 
and different false, you know, deities, and they were calling on them. Hopefully, something would 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 break loose, you know, and they would have calm. But they said, Jonah, maybe maybe you, uh, you know, it's not working for us to call upon God, right? So maybe you call upon your God, and maybe you'll get better results. Here's what I want you to never forget. This is so important. Whenever we choose to disobey God, whenever we choose to run from God, to resist His will for our lives, whenever we refuse His leading in our lives, you need to understand this. The chaos of that, the chaos that's going to come from that is never, never neatly contained to our own private lives as as much as we would like to think it is. That's the lie of our world, right? Well, I'm sinning, but you don't bother me with that because it's my own private choice. It's not hurting anybody else. That is a lie. Even if you can't see it, even if you don't think it is affecting anybody around you, listen, our, our choice to disobey always spills out and creates negative consequences for people around us, more people than we could ever imagine. You might want to write this down too. The quickest way to derail and destroy your life is through disobedience. I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning and say, you know what, I would really like to derail and destroy my entire life and that of my family today. How can I best accomplish? I don't think it's like that. But you need to know that's the truth. The quickest way to derail and destroy your life is through disobedience. But here's what also you need to keep in mind. Rarely, rarely, I mean very rarely, is anybody's life or family or marriage destroyed through one act of disobedience. And that's the deception of it, right? That's, the, that's what makes sin and rebellion against God so dangerous because we often don't see any immediate consequences, and we're like, well, maybe I got away from it. God shall not be mocked, amen? What we reap, we sow in due time. You, even, it, not immediately. It may not feel bad at first. It may not bring any pain at first. And, and again, it's so dangerous because Satan is just chattering in our ear. See, see, maybe God's Word isn't true. Maybe he doesn't really care. Maybe he doesn't really know what you're doing here in the darkness. That's the, and, and it feels good at first, right? It, it feel, it may, you may even trick yourself to believing it feels right, and it's a good thing. You may have other people around you saying it's a good thing. And in fact, it may at first feel like freedom, right? But we know that's a lie. We have to remember always that the consequences of our disobedience sends out dangerous ripples into other people's lives far beyond our own private life. But here's the good news, okay? You ready for some good news? God is so gracious, amen? I'm talking like unbelievably, unimaginably gracious is our God and kind and loving and, and patient with us, right? And, and I would just add this too. If we, could, if we could somehow understand how gracious and kind and patient and loving and all of that that God is, it would, it would probably cause us to treat people in our life a little differently, right? That maybe it's hard to respond that way too. It would cause us to be a lot more graceful and kind and patient. But remember, like we shared last week, the story of Jonah isn't really about Jonah. It's not about the storm. It's not about the fish. It's about God's heart for all people and his relentless pursuit of those he loves. Listen to this. Even when they blow it. Amen? Even when they absolutely blow it. And so God, he, because of his great love and kindness and patience and, and, and all this, he goes after Jonah. He doesn't say, oh, well, fine. I'll find me another prophet. He blew it. He's done. He's out. No, he doesn't do that. He pursues Jonah big time. And you can read in chapter 1 how Jonah then, you know, he wakes up from his nap and he tells the soldier, or the sailors, he says, uh, hey, the storm is really all my fault. He finally gets honest. And they ask him, what, what, what should we do? What, what, do you, what do you suggest? And then he says, well, what you need to do is throw me overboard. And if you throw me overboard, the storm will calm. And it, interestingly enough, as you read the Scripture, they didn't want to do it, Right? It's really ironic to me that these pagan sailors who didn't even know the one true God personally yet, they have more compassion for people than Jonah, God's very own prophet. And they don't want to kill him. They're like, no, 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 no. That's crazy talk. If we throw you into the raging sea, you will die. And so they try everything they can to get it back to shore. Finally, they realize, though, it's a futile effort. It, it's not going to work. And so you can kind of see them, right? you got to picture this in your mind. They grab Jonah, and they got a grimace on their face. They're like, Okay, man, we really don't want to do this. God, please forgive us. And they throw him overboard into the raging sea. It's, it's, it's a great story, right? Now, here's the part we've all been waiting for, okay? Here's, here it is. God, out of nowhere, it sends this huge fish. He sends this huge fish to swallow Jonah up. 
He sends a huge fish, right? Now, here's what you got to get when you read this. If you misread this, if you don't read this carefully, here's what you're going to think. And maybe some of you do think this. Maybe you think this because this is the view you have of God. If you don't read this carefully, you're going to read this and think that this fish that God sent to swallow Jonah up was his punishment. But that's not true. Look at the first word. Now, the Lord punished Jonah by sending a huge fish. Is that what it says? No. It says the Lord what? Provided. Provided a huge fish for Jonah to grab onto and swim safely back to shore, right? No, no, no. He sent a huge, he provided a huge fish to eat Jonah. That's what it says. But again, here's what you have to keep in mind. This fish, this sea creature, whatever, it literally means sea creature, whatever it was, it was not God's punishment. Catch this. It was God's provision. He did not send this fish, he did not send this fish to pay Jonah back for his rebellion. He sent this fish to bring Jonah back. To bring him back in alignment, right? To bring him back into a place of blessing with God and a relationship with God where he could experience the joy and the privilege of partnering with God on his mission. That's why he sent the fish. And sometimes we just need to stop and remember that, right? We need to remember that when we experience our own moments of being in the belly of the fish. Whatever that may represent for you. That can mean a lot of different things for us. But sometimes it... We need to be aware that the activity of God in our lives seems a whole lot more like punishment when actually, many times, because of our who our God is, it's actually His grace, His gracious provision for us, right? So we need not to kick against it and, and rebel against it even more. We need to submit to it. Listen, so many places, so many times in God's Word, God has chosen to reveal Himself as our Father. That's very appropriate, especially today, right? And like a perfect father that he is, and because of his absolutely perfect love for us, here's what God does. God disciplines his children. Now, you may not like that. You may not desire that, but that's what God does. He is absolutely committed to seeing the full expression of his will come to reality in your life. And, And many times, in order to make that happen and cause, that, cause you to experience, he needs to discipline you. You can think about it in earthly terms, right? Now, discipline could take on many different forms, right? But we must discipline our children. The Bible is very clear about that. If you as a parent or a caregiver did not discipline your children, you know what would happen? You would absolutely wreck their lives. You would. If you withheld discipline from them, if you gave them everything they want and never let them experience the pain and the consequences of their choices, And their disobedience against you, it would be actually the most unloving thing you could ever do to a child is never to discipline them. But God, because of the perfect father that he is, he disciplines us. He disciplines his children. You know why? Here it is. To save us from ourselves. Hello. To bring us back many times from the brink of destruction because of the destructive path we've chosen to walk because foolishly sometimes... We believe that we know better than God, and we choose our way over God's. But God, God does this to bring us back where we need to be so we can experience the, the fullness of life, the abundance of life that He died and rose again to give us. And I really think, I think this right here, this, what I'm getting ready to share with you, is the mark of a true, mature disciple. Do you know God's will for you is not just to get saved and get to heaven and be a Christian infant your entire life here on this earth. God's will for you is to mature and to grow and to deepen and to become more like Christ in every way. And and I believe this characteristic right here of having a sensitive and responsive heart, one that is quick, I mean quick to obey whatever the Lord is directing us to do, that is one of the key characteristics of a mature disciple and a follower of Jesus. You know, in reality... Although this huge fish was God's provision, I really believe it was because it says he provided it. It was his provision. But let me tell you this in love. He should not have to send a fish into your life. And you just let that fish represent whatever it needs to be or currently is in your life. But here's what I'm saying. God should not have to send a major calamity. He should not have to send a severe storm into your life to bring you back and get your attention as to what He wants to do in and through your life. Amen? 
He should not have to do that to get you to turn around. And, and I don't know about you, I, I really just am inclined to believe that you desire this as much as I do, but I, I want to live in such closeness with God Every day, not just on Sundays, but every single day, I want to live in such closeness with God that when God wants to move me, when God wants me to go somewhere, when God wants me to talk to someone, when God wants to use me in a particular way that seems very challenging to me, I want to live in such closeness with God that He doesn't have to whip me to get me to do it. All He has to do is whisper to me. Amen? He just, just, psst, psst. Right? That's all he has to do. You know, I, I said this first service, on my kids' best days, when they were little, especially on their best days, all I had to do was say. I, I, we were in a crowd of people and I couldn't get to them. I was just like, Mm-mm, nope. And they would just like, they would just submit, right? On their best days. On their worst days, I had to drag them out of the room. I'm just being honest, right? God, don't make God drag you out of the room. Hey, can I tell you this? Don't make God come chasing after you all the time to get you to do what you know in your heart is the right thing to do and live in accordance with his word. I just, I just tell you this in love. There's no joy in that. There's no delight in that. There's no blessing in that whatsoever, none. And besides that, I, I pray this morning that the Holy Spirit will impress upon you today how incredibly dangerous it is to run from God. This is pretty heavy, but I'm just going to say it. Eternity, eternity is a long, long, long time to live with the regret of what you should have done and what could have been and how incredibly God could have used your life to impact people all around you and advance His kingdom while you're we're living this brief life on this earth. It's an incredibly long time, eternity is, to contemplate our failure at that point. We, we don't want to end up there. We don't want to go down that path. So here's what I want to encourage you to do. Make it the posture of your heart to be such that when God calls you, when God desires to send you, when God speaks a word to you, your response is, is not like Jonah where you run as hard and fast as you can away and make God come after you with a storm and a fish. Instead, it's more like Samuel who said, remember the boy Samuel? Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. I am listening. I am your servant, right? Or maybe more like Isaiah, here I am, Lord. Here I am, send me. All right? Or like Peter, hey, hey, God, because you said so, I will do it. Because you said so, I will do it. We, we want that to be the pattern of our lives. But here's what I want to do this morning. I want to kind of turn the corner this morning, and I want to speak a word of hope, and I want to speak a word of strong biblical encouragement into the life of someone here today who, who you may find yourself in a tough place this morning. You may find yourself in a dark place this morning because of, if you're honest, probably because of your choices. You went right when God said go left. You stayed put when God said advance. You heard God's word. You understood what he wanted. You chose to do something different. You chose your will over, over God's will. What, the question is, what, what do we do when we get into a place like that? Maybe some of you, if we're really honest, some of you this morning, maybe even listening online, you're perhaps experiencing the residue right now, the consequences of, who knows, weeks, months, years of running from God. So the question is, is there any hope there? I believe there is. What do we do when we find ourselves in that dark place, when we find ourselves in the equivalent, our equivalent of the belly of the fish? Well, here's the right answer right here. Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. Look at it with me. From inside the fish. That's about as low as you can get, right? You may have had a bad day, but I guarantee you've never had that bad of day. Inside the belly of the fish, Jonah, here it is, prayed to the Lord his God. Amen? I bet he did. I bet he prayed hard. Right there. I love it. Right there in that dirty, dark, smelly, nasty place. He starts to call out to the Lord his God, and he prays probably one of the most sincere prayers he's ever prayed in his life. Interestingly, a few moments ago, he, he didn't want to have anything to do with God. He couldn't get far enough away from God. And now, interestingly enough, God's got his attention, and he's like, um, God, can we talk? Can we talk for a minute, God? I have some things I want to share with you. And, and you and I, if we're honest, would do the same thing. Let me just read all of all of chapter 2 right here. It says, um, 
In my distress, I called to the Lord, and He answered me. From the deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the heart of the sea, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep waters surrounded me. Seaweed, this is very descriptive, seaweed wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, here's what I did. I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols and turn away from God's love for them, uh, those who cling to worthless idols, here's what they do. They turn away from God's love for them. An idol is anything you make more important and more valuable than God in your life. And when you do that, you turn away from God's love. But I, Jonah says, with shouts of grateful praise will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord, here's what the Lord did. The Lord commanded the fish and it vomited. That's a gross word. That's the grossest word of the English language. Vomited Jonah onto the dry land. All right. Here's what I love about Jonah, though. I love what he says right there at the beginning. He says, In my distress, in that awful, in the darkest place of my life, in the time, listen, in the time when I absolutely blew it because I knew I did something I knew better than to do, I called to the Lord and he answered me. Listen, I want to affirm to you this morning that when you're in trouble, there's only one place to turn, and his name is Jesus. When you're in the pit, amen. When you're in the pit, there's only one who can help you, and his name is Jesus. And Jonah finally woke up, right? He, God got his attention. And Jonah took that critical but difficult first step back to the path of blessing. Jonah knew this. Jonah knew he had no power within himself to help himself. Some of us need to get to that point. In our sin and our brokenness, we need to finally realize, I need a Savior. I need his forgiveness. I can't clean my life up. I can't polish it up on the outside. I can't go to church enough days of the week to make this right. I need his salvation. I need his forgiveness. Jonah realized he couldn't help himself. He also realized this. There was no human help for me in this predicament. The guys on the boat weren't going to help him, right? There was no way they could provide any help. If they could have, they would have, but they couldn't. And the truth is, nobody except God was going to provide any solution to this guy's problem. And I, I just... I have this suspicion. I have this suspicion many times that we as God's people, we spend much longer than we need to in the hard places. We spend much longer in the dark places and the desperate places than we ever need to simply because of this, because we are looking in the wrong places for our help. And there we are in the belly of the fish, and we get frustrated, and we get angry, and we start, you know, call, you know, accusing God of all these things that are not in alignment with who He really is, and it's because we're not getting the answers we want, and we're not seeing things change as quickly as we want. But again, I would suggest it's not because God is unfaithful, it's because we're looking in the wrong places. We're turning to the wrong things for help. That's why when I thought about this, Psalm 121 immediately came to my mind. And I love Psalm 121. Now, let, me just, let, me, let me read it for you, and I'll explain a little more about it. He says this in verse 1, I lift my eyes to the hills. Then ask a great question, where does my help come from? Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. What's really interesting about this psalm is actually it's not a single psalm, it's a collection. It's in a collection of psalms. And they're called the Psalms of Ascent. Psalms of ascent, meaning climbing, ascending, going up. The reason they're called that is because these are the songs. That they go from all the way from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. That whole section are the Psalms of ascent. And the people of God, when they were making their trip to Jerusalem to worship the Lord, they would be going up. And the reason they would be, no matter which direction you travel from, right? We say up north, down south, you know, back west, you know, out, out west, back east, whatever. But it doesn't matter. When you were going to Jerusalem, you were always going up because it was elevated compared to the surrounding territory, right? And so as they were climbing in elevation, they would sing these songs. It's really cool. The, some, some of these we have recorded in, our, in, our, in the book of Psalms. These were their worship jams, all right? They were jamming out. They were like, woo, man. They were, they were getting excited as they were going to 
worship the Lord. And Psalm 120 is a part of that, Psalm 121 is a part of that collection. Now, here's the cool thing. As they would be heading to Jerusalem to worship the Lord, they would look at all the surrounding hills that, that surrounded Jerusalem. And here's what they knew were in the hills, right? In the hills were many, many different options and offers for help. Many different offers for provision that the people could look to. Because the hills were filled with all these kinds of shrines and high places and altars that people would go up to. And they didn't have time to wait on God, so they'd try to take a shortcut. And they would go to call upon the name of all these false gods and these false, you know, um, deities, right? And they would sacrifice to them and they would, they would try to get what they thought they needed from in these other ways. And, and it never worked. And so what David says is, I look to the hills, right? I, I, as I'm worship, going to worship God... And going to seek His presence, I look out to the hills, and, and, and I, look, I look to the hills, and there's all these answers, right, for people's most pressing challenges. But here's what David knew, and here's what we need to remember and always hold on to. The only thing, listen carefully, the only thing you ever bring back from the hills is frustration, disappointment, and emptiness. You know Why? Because that's what you always get when you go looking for the kind of help and hope that only God Himself can provide. In lo you're looking in other places for the kind of help that only He can provide. And so David knew this, and so he says, I lift my eyes to the hills. I'm going to worship God. I lift my eyes. I see all these other options. Where does my help come from? From the hills? No way. Not a chance. I know that will only end in heartache. But my help, my strength... My supply, my deliverance, come on, church, my provision, my security, my joy, amen, comes only from the Lord God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. We need to remember that. And so Jonah chapter 2, it helps us remember, right, that when we're in a tough spot, when we're in a dark place, either because of our own choices and our own decisions or because of the choices of others, any, either way, Whatever reason we find ourselves in the belly of the fish, here's what you need to remember. Prayer is always, I'm telling you, always the appropriate first response. Always. You may not feel like it. You may not feel like talking to God. You may not think God will receive you in that moment, but it's not true. Prayer is always the appropriate first response. And so let me just give you this little acrostic, okay? Just out of those letters, pray, P-R-A-Y. I love to do that. I love to give you practical handles that you can hold on to so this becomes more than just head knowledge and just some biblical facts about Jonah. And you can take this out of here into your real life beyond these walls and live it out and honor God. Amen? And bring God glory this week through your life and experience Him using you no matter where you're currently at. So pray. This little acrostic I think will it'll help you pray. P. This simply stands for pour your heart out to God. That's where you need to start. Pour your heart out to God. And what I mean by that is just be real, be raw, be transparent, be, be totally honest with God. He knows everything already. Amen? He knows everything already. So, listen, when you pray, you don't have to polish it up. You don't have to clean it all up. You don't have to get it all in order. You don't have to um, get your emotions all in check. L listen, your prayer is not an English paper. Hello? You don't have to spell check it. You don't have to make sure the grammar's right. You don't have to correct the run-on sentences. Just let her rip, okay? Say, God, here it is. Here's the ugly truth about where I'm at, and here's why I'm here. You know it already, and I confess it, God, and you just get real and honest before God. Pour your heart out to God. R, R, realize that God will answer. Realize He will answer. Some of us, perhaps the reason you don't pray as you desire to, as the Bible instructs us to, the reason maybe you don't pray in a way that would lead you to a more powerful relationship with God is because maybe you don't really believe and expect you're going to get an answer from God. Maybe you have this false belief that God kind of just wound the universe up and let it spin and there's nothing you can do about it. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. That is so not biblical. You read all the time in God's Word how people prayed and things changed. People prayed and God responded in response to His people's prayers and faith. Now, He didn't always do things the way we ask for them, certainly, but I, a prayer is a powerful thing. The, the prayers of God's people are powerful and effective, the book of James tells us. So when you, when you pray, 
R, realize God will answer. When you pray, expect God to answer. Ready yourself for a response from your heavenly Father. Again, Jonah says, you answered me. You listened to my cry for help. Even though Jonah had run from God, get this, he ran from God. He told God, no, I'm not doing it. He was in this awful place because of his disobedience, yet he had the confidence that as he poured out his heart to God, God would hear his prayer and and answer. And so, so pray expecting that, realize that, and then be patient as you wait on God's answer. A, P-R-A, always believe. Always believe. Have the faith to believe that what you ask God to do, He is more than able to do. Right? More than able. Believe this. And this is one of the toughest things when we've blown it. It's tough to believe that God loves me. Nothing we could ever do. This is, now, don't, don't mishear this. This is not an excuse to persist in your sin and just live however you feel like living, right? And call yourself a Christian anyway. That is not Christianity. That is not what a disciple is. But, having said that, this is also true. Even in our sin, you, have not, you cannot lessen God's unconditional love for you. It's just that. It's unconditional. So believe, even in your lowest moments, God still loves you. He wants the best for you. He has a plan for your life. Believe that even in the darkest moments, as you turn back to Him in sincere faith and repentance, that God can use that pain and that misery and that painful experience for His glory. Believe that because of His great mercy, He can rescue you. Believe that through genuine repentance and by showing the fruit of repentance in your life, God can restore you. Amen? Believe this. How about this? Believe that as you turn to Him sincerely, he will re- He's not going to put you on probation. He's not going to say, well, let's see how you act in the next six months. No, He's going to reinstate you as a full partner in His kingdom work. I'm telling you, He did it for Jonah. He did it for David. He did it for Peter. Peter denied three times that he even knew Jesus. Walked for him three and a half years. He walked with him. Was with him every day. Denied that he even called down curses on him. If I know him, may I be cursed and die. And, and, he, and, he, and he fell hard. And yet God restored him. He became the leader of the church. It's incredible. He believed that, okay? He, he did it for them. He can do it for you. And then why, finally, why? Yield to whatever God tells you to do. So as you're calling out to God, God's going to be responding. He's going to believe, you're believing He's going to have an answer for you. He's going to get you back on track. And then whatever He leads you to do, understand, He's not going to change His plan, right? He's going to, he's going to, He comes right back to the message and the mission that Jonah, He had for Jonah. He's going to do the same for you. And so you've got to be ready to yield to whatever God tells you to do in that moment. And I'll just say this really, really honestly and really bluntly. If you're not willing to carry on with this step, I don't see any value in praying at all, to be honest. If you're just going to pray and act sorrowful and and cry some tears and yet not follow through, um, yield, though, to whatever God tells you to do. Just simply commit. Here's what you need to commit to. Here's a simple way to pray it. This is so powerful. You say, God, I want your will more than my will. That's it. You don't have to get fancy. You don't have to be long-winded. You don't have to pray for a whole day. You just say, God, I can see your heart. I want your will more than my will. What a, what a simple but powerful prayer. And I just thought it would be good to act on that this morning. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like to just throw things out like that without seizing the moment for us to actually do that. Maybe some of you need to pray that. Not when you leave here. Not when you get home. Not Monday. You need to pray it right now. And so no pressure at all from me. But if you sincerely want to pray that, and you are sincere in saying, God, by your grace, I will follow through and I will live that way. I want to invite you to pray that with me right now, okay? You can even hold out your hands if you want to. You can, you can lift it. You can do whatever you need to do. Would you pray that with me if you mean it? If you mean it. You don't have to pray this, okay? God doesn't want you to pray it if you don't mean it. But if you mean it, pray that with me. Ready? God, I want your will more than my will. Let's pray it again. Not because God is hard of hearing. Let's just reaffirm it in our own hearts. Ready? Say it with some passion. Ready? God, I want your will more than my will. Can you imagine how things would change in the course of your day if you just pray that, man? Just pray that at different points when you start your day, especially when you've blown it. God, I want your will more than my will. That's what Jonah did in Jonah 2.9. Look what it says there. He says, I will offer 
sacrifices to you with songs of praise. I will fulfill my vows. I, I love another translation that says, I will do everything I promise God. So in other words, he's not praying this, he's not praying this frightened prayer, this foxhole religious prayer, like, okay, God, if you get me out of this situation, I'll do it. I'll become a missionary. I'll and then forget about it the second you get out of danger, right? He's not doing that. He's saying, God, I mean this. I'm sincere. I want my will over your will. I will do everything I promised for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Again, the point being, when you find yourself in the tough, dark places of life, don't run from God, run to God. Don't, don't hide from God. Seek God out with all your heart. Don't try to stifle His voice, all right? Don't, don't look away from Him. Look to Him. And I know it seems so obvious, right? You're like, well, of course, that's, that's how we should live. It seems so obvious, and, and our energy is high, and we're in a wonderful worship service. And we're like, yes, I'm going to do it this week. I'm going to live that way. But I also realize our human nature, and I realize the pressure cooker moments that you're going to experience when you get out of these walls, and you get home, and you get to your job on Monday, or whatever you look forward to. And, and, and here's what we tend to do. Here's our tendency that we need to be guarding our heart against. We tend to focus more on the problem than on God. We tend to fixate on the problem rather than fix our eyes on Jesus, right? Whenever we have a problem, whenever we're in a dark place, we, we look at the problem, we analyze the problem, we lay awake all night thinking about the problem, we worry about the problem, we Google the problem. We get on Facebook and we say, I can't really share any details, but if you had this problem, what would you do, right? Don't ask me anything, you know. <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> this morning, God wants to remind us there's a much, much better approach. And here it is, right in the Word of God. We always turn to the Word of God here at JCNAS. Okay, here it is, right here. I don't, just, I don't just make these things up, all right? Psalm 105, verse 4. Here's what you should do instead. Look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always. Look to who? And seek what? Always, there's the key word, right? Always, always. Notice Jonah did that. When Jonah truly prayed out of the depths, this powerful, sincere prayer, notice the incredible results. Jonah chapter 2, verse 10. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it look, vomited Jonah onto dry land. And then the Lord commanded the fish. I love that. He commanded, after this prayer, right, this amazing crying out in faith, after exhibiting that the true state of his heart was one of yielded, yieldedness, submission. Only then, then and only then was he truly set free. I had to chuckle about this, though, when I first read about this whale throwing Jonah up on the beach. Because at this point in the story, this creature, this sea creature, is more responsive and obedient to God than the prophet of God was. That's pretty sad commentary, right? You don't want to let a whale out, do you? Or whatever it is, great fish. But the Lord commanded the fish, and it did what God asked it to do. Here's what I want to encourage you. Fathers, especially today, fathers, parents, mothers, leaders here in our church, leaders in this community, servants of God, let me challenge you to set the bar of obedience high in your life. Never compromise. Let me challenge you to be an inspiration. Let me challenge you to be an example of what following God really looks like in this world to others around you. And here's what I've experienced many times, and here's what I know is true. When you commit to living a life like that, God, He will empower you through the very Spirit that lives in you to live that way, okay? You don't have to grind it out. You don't have to, oh, I hope I can do this. No, you just let the Spirit of God live through you, amen, and lead you on that path. So let me just share this, and then we'll give ourselves to God in a time of worship and a time of response. But this is such good news to end on, okay? Jonah chapter 3, and let me remind you, we got one more week here. Next week, I'll bring in the third part of this series. We're going to take a little break to worship in the park. We're going to be back the following week to finish up Jonah, okay? So just so you know where we're going. Jonah chapter 3, here it is. Then the word of the Lord. You guys can come on up if you want to. Come, worship team, come and join me up here as I'm sharing this. From Jonah chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Don't you love that? God didn't wipe him out. God didn't say, you're done, you blew it, you're finished, I'll find someone else. No, he wanted, he wanted to use Jonah as frail and faulty. And he comes to, comes to Jonah a second time, right? He gives Jonah a second chance. Here's what he said. Go to the great city of Nineveh 
and proclaim to it the message I give to you. And here, I love this. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, before we throw up the next slide, I want you to stand to your feet if you're able. I want you to ready yourself. Stand to your feet. We're being sent out of here by the Lord our God into a mission field. We're being sent. You're, you're going to be called in specific ways this week. And I want to make this real and personal to you. We read what Jonah did, but this story is not about Jonah. Today is about you and your response to God. So here's what Jonah did. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord, and he went. He went to Nineveh. That's where he went. None of you are going to be called to Nineveh, I'm sure, this week. I, I could be wrong, but probably not. But I want you to personalize this. I want you to look at this and focus on this for a minute. Make this very real and personal. I want you to put your name there, your name. I'll put my name. Mark, obey the word of the Lord. I, I, here's what I believe. I believe God will be speaking to many of you this week about very specific things, about something very specific He wants you to do, about a place He wants you to go. Uh, listen, about a person He wants you to invite here next week or show His love in a practical way too. Mark obeyed the word of the Lord, and he went to, who, maybe God right now is filling in those blanks for you, amen? Maybe you haven't thought about this until right now, but the Holy Spirit is speaking so clearly to so many of you. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to be said of you this week? If we come back next week and the scriptures were written about you, you obeyed the word of the Lord, and you went, you went, you did, did what God asked you to do, amen? Would you just look at that for another few seconds, would you, would you pray out of the depths of your heart right now, wherever you're at, whatever your relationship has been like with the Lord, this week, would you just make that real? Would you call out to Him? Would you pour your heart out to Him? Would you realize that God will answer? Believe that God is able to do what you're asking Him to do. Will you yield yourself entirely to God right now? As you're thinking about what God's calling you to do and where He's sending you this week, maybe even today, maybe, maybe before you do anything, maybe before you eat lunch, maybe before you go home, do you need to do what the Lord's called you to do? Maybe it's that urgent, I don't know. Would you just pray this prayer again? God, I want my will over your will. yield ourselves to you, God. God, you are Lord Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. You help us so faithfully at every turn in our lives. In the good, in the bad, in the valleys and on the mountaintops, you are there to faithfully provide for us and to lead us and to guide us. So God, our desire is to be your people on this earth to be your messengers, to be your ambassadors, God, to, to obey you, to be eager to respond to you where you lead us. God, we say out of the depths of our heart this morning, anywhere, anytime, any place, any person, God, send us. We're ready and we're, we're, we're willing to respond, God. We want to do your will. We want to see revival come on this earth. We want to see your kingdom come and your will be done just as it is in heaven right here among us. Lord, we surrender. We repent. God, when we went left and you called us to go right, when we made the wrong turn, knowing it was wrong, we repent of that, God. We turn from it completely. And we look only you, we look only to you to help us and strengthen us to live a life of purity and live a life of obedience and live a life of, of pleasing you at every level. Lord, we give you all of our praise. If you just keep your head bowed for one more prayer for one more minute. I just want to extend a very simple and yet a very important and personal invitation to anyone who is coming here today. Maybe you're just checking this place out. Maybe, maybe you don't even know why you came today. You know, it's like, I just, I just felt like I should be here. Maybe someone invited you. Whoever you are, if you've never personally called upon the Lord Jesus Christ to save you, to be your Savior, to forgive you of all your sins, if you've never, if you can never remember a time in your life where you put your full faith in who Jesus is and what He's done for you, that He is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, that He literally came to this earth and gave His life on a cross and died to cleanse you of all your sin and restore you 
to a right relationship with God, if you've never remember a time where you put your faith in that reality and gave your life fully to God, let me just encourage you, today's the day. Don't wait another time. Don't wait another day. Don't go another week in uncertainty about where you stand with God. You can nail that down. It doesn't take a week to become a Christian. It doesn't take a month. You could become a follower of Jesus Christ. You could be born again. You could become a child of God today. And if anybody wants that, if you want that to be true in your life, you pray this prayer and God will answer it. He will change you. I'm telling you, He'll change you from the inside out. He will lead you on an adventure. This is the most, the most wonderful thing you could ever imagine. Doesn't mean your life will be perfect. Doesn't mean all your problems will go away. You'll still have struggles and battles. But you'll have God on your side. Amen. You'll belong to God, and you'll know where you'll spend eternity no matter what happens in your life or on this earth. So I just simply say, if you want that, would you? we're not going to ask you to speak. We're not going to ask you to come up front. You're not joining the church, but we want you to be bold and make a commitment to God of your life. And if you want that, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. One, two, three, right where you are. Raise your hand if you want that right now. If you've never prayed that, you wonder where you are with God, but you, you, believe, you believe that there's a moment where I need to turn to Him. Anybody at all? But at all, this is your chance. Don't be afraid. Don't be timid. I want to lead you in a prayer, okay? All right. Okay. Praise God, all right? Let me pray for you. Father, may your blessings be upon your people. May you be our strength. You are our hope. You are our help. Lead us out of here in confidence, God. We want to be on mission for you, God. We are your people. You're our God. We give you all of our praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hey, have an incredible weekend, all right? Let's give God praise this morning as we leave. All right, praise God. Good to be with you. Encourage one another as you leave this place.